Good evening. Welcome to Sanford Mill on February the 14th, 2022. The centenary, 100 years since the very first scheduled British radio broadcast went out from the hut behind me. This is a 1916 World War I Type A hut. It had already sat in a field in Rittle for nearly four years as the squadron mess for the Royal Naval Air Service. The Marconi Company buy it in 1919 and install a new division called the Airborne Wireless Telephony Research Division. These are all ex Royal Flying Corps, or now RAF officers, who have developed airborne radio over the trenches so that aircraft could talk to aircraft. An amazing technological explosion. And in this very hut, for the next two years, they're going to develop air to air communication for the new art of civilian aircraft tourism. You could suddenly, by the end of 1919, fly in a converted bomber from Croydon to the south of France to go on your holiday, if you're wealthy, but of course you sat in a wicker basket with waiters serving you five-course meals. All that needed at communications, direction finding, weather reports. In this hut, a gentleman called Peter Eckersley, leading his team of brilliant engineers, developed all that equipment, including starting a little place called Heathrow which will become quite important one day. All the air communication was developed in this hut. Now, in 1920, there have been some experiments from Chelmsford, from W.T. Ditcham and Henry Joseph Round, where they'd put out using huge signals. This was just blue sky research, private research, but it became very popular. And in June 1920, Damien Melba sang at the studio, the first recorded professional artiste. The trouble is that station was running 15,000 watts into huge 450-foot aerials and it swamped everything, including the new air traffic control system. There was an aeroplane flying back from Paris in bad weather, desperately trying to get direction and weather information. All they could hear was a musical soiree from Chelmsford. So in November 1920, it shuts down. The radio amateurs were not impressed. They start lobbying, they form a radio society of Great Britain, they put a petition into the government saying, we want radio broadcasting, because everything else was just Morse code. Dit, dit, da, da, dit, dit, boring, monotonous. They wanted to hear entertainment and music, because Chelmsford had shown them what was possible. The genie was out of the bottle. So in February 1922, the postmaster comes to the Marconi company and said, do this thing called broadcasting. We don't know what it is, but just do it. Do it from this hut here. At last, it was announced that a wireless telephony programme would be permitted once a week, for half an hour. The station chosen was Rittle, with a power of half a kilowatt. I happened to be in the Marconi Company at the time, and um, we inhabited a place called Rittle, a, a hut, a long, low hut full of long, low people. And we had a wireless transmitter, and we were eventually appointed by the Radio Society of Great Britain to do this thing called broadcasting. Now, Marconi's weren't particularly impressed with it because they still could not work out where the business was in broadcasting. You sell one transmitter and then millions of people can listen in for free. And that, that has echoed through the years as a problem of how you fund what we now call the BBC. But in this hut, those problems were a long way in the future because they said to Peter Eckersley, just do this thing called broadcasting. Just make it up, invent it. Half an hour each week on a Tuesday night. You do it in your own time. Any equipment has to be returned. There's very strict regulations, including closing down every three minutes to listen for interference you might be causing with the military or uh, their traffic control system. The power had to be limited to one kilowatt, was it? And that had to include the power that was uh, necessary for illuminating the, or heating the filaments of the valve. But it took two kilowatts to do that already. However, um, we, we still owe the Postmaster General a number of kilowatts. But uh, we went ahead, nevertheless, and that's how probably the first regular broadcasting station in Britain ever started. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. This is 2 Emma Talk, Rittle testing. Hello, CQ. Hello. Hello, Ash. Hello, Ash. Ash, hello. Are the signals OK? No, they're not. Wave your hand if it's all OK. No waves? No waves at all. So the first transmission goes out exactly 100 years ago tonight. Oh, it's a magical evening. Um, about now, which has just gone 8 o'clock, they'd just be coming to an end. They'd already done half an hour of Morse code, then half an hour of speech. Robert Howard come here and sung live. He'd sung the floral dance and the bosun's lament. Uh, Noel Ashbridge had done some talking. 
it didn't go out very well, there was a problem with the signal, they'd had to replace, the transmitter had blown up. It's always a technical hitch, as Eckersley used to call it. But a week later, Eckersley is going to step to the microphone. Yes, he might have done quite a lot of gin and tonic at the Cock and Bell pub and some fish and chips. They pushed the piano down the hill. The original piano is in here. We'll see it in a minute. Um, what will then happen will change the world forever. What will then happen will give us a new age of mass communication, mass entertainment, a new age of mass electronic manufacture. Everything we now know is going to be born in this hut. We were, we were half an hour a week half an hour a week, every Tuesday. And um, we just broadcast, that's all. You know, with Drittle, uh, we didn't have any elaborate studio or any wonderful gadgets and uh, things like that. What we had was, uh, when we wanted to play a gramophone record, we had a perfectly good mechanical gramophone with open doors. And you opened the doors and you put the needle on and it scratched and it played little music. And then you held the microphone in front of the open doors where the sound poured out from. Well, welcome to history, I guess. 100 years to the night. This is the original Marconi hut. This is the original broadcast studio. Everything you now know in radio broadcasting starts here. Indeed, the early concerts, this is the original piano and even the original stool. It doesn't play particularly well now, but I'm sure Eckersley would have liked to play it here. This room served the Marconi company for nearly 50 years and its window of 2MT in Rittle was perhaps nine, 10 months. But what Eckersley will do in this room, standing exactly where I am now with a microphone, transmitter to the my right hand side, will define and write the history of broadcasting for the next 100 years. Everything you now know that's radio, sound effects studio in the corner. And we were indeed not only pioneers in transmission, we were pioneers in programme. We, in fact, did the first radio play that I suppose was ever broadcast. If you want a door slamming, slam the door with a microphone. The first volume control, just move the microphone away from the speaker. There's no faders in 922. The first Lonely Hearts Club is done here. The first phone-in quiz. And indeed, just where I'm standing, the very first radio play. Serrano de Bergerac. It's the balcony scene, you don't have to move around much for that. But they even found that if you're reading a script with a single microphone and you turn the pages, it makes a huge noise. Do you remember the phrase, cough and you're deaf in thousands? Well, what they actually found was, they actually, and you still do it today, I did a radio thing the other day, you actually turn around and you turn your script away and then come back to the microphone. Now, of course, it's all on a computer screen. It just screams through as you speak. But all that was developed here. If you wanted it louder, you just moved the microphone nearer. And if you wanted it softer, you moved the microphone further away. We were able to keep one of the smoothest volumes control that has ever been invented. Of course, today, I mean, there are sliding resistor wires and wonderful faders and this and that, but <laughs> pioneers are always no best. By the summer of 1922, 50 companies want their own radio station to mimic 2MT. 50,000 listeners, maybe more, we don't know because there's no broadcast licenses yet. But everyone realises that radio now has a future. The programmes later became a little more frivolous. There was a time when uh, I used to go home and let the others do the transmissions, but one time I stayed and had some dinner at the local, and then I sort of suddenly felt that perhaps this formality was a little bit much, and picked up the microphone, jabbered, didn't shut down for any three minutes. And um, next morning, when we came in and had a post-mortem, all the staff sat around and said this. I said, oh, did I say that? Oh, my God. Well, welcome to the business end of 
transmitting radio in 1922. This is a recreation of the original transmitter, which was originally the Croydon air traffic control transmitter. This was the spare one. These valves are original. They are the valves that have been used, and much of the equipment here is as it would have been 1922. Part of the strange thing about the Riddle broadcasts during that summer is that all the equipment they used for the famous broadcast in the evening, the next day had to be returned to normal use. So nothing survives from that time. And also technology was moving so quickly that really what we have here is, is a fantastic recreation of the transmitter. Um, the output bottle valves here, these transmitters, when this was a light, these would glow bright blue. And if an experienced engineer, they'd actually watch these, and they were called blushing. So when you're on the microphone, if you are over-modulating, and Eckersley shouted at the microphone all the time, this would go very bright blue and start and flash. And Ashbridge would just wave at him and say, calm down, and he never did. Because it made that squeaky, so they could control it. And of course, on the very first night, the very first signal, this thing blew up. You know, the very first night, 100 years ago, this thing failed, and they had to replace this, which is the capacitor. And when they replaced it, they got one that was 100,000 times too big, which meant that the concert first night was very squeaky. Hello, CQ, I'm blasting. Do you want a blast? I blast a whole lot. But, um, oh, it's not going out at all. Are you quite sure? But it's your fault. For heaven's sake, then connect it up. Well, it isn't. Oh, it is. Hello, CQ. And this has all been going on. I'm sorry, there was a big, a bit, bit un understanding. A little bit of a technical hitch. Uh, yes, yes, you have them too. I know, aren't they awful? But anyway, I think we'll be getting ready to begin now. They fixed it, and luckily, when Eckersley came to the microphone, it all got a lot better. The microphone Eckersley used was exactly this. This is a standard 1919 telephone handset. This would have been just half of what's sat on your phone or your desk. Its frequency response is appalling. It really is very narrow. I really didn't like transmitting musical instruments. Strangely, it transmitted records quite well. And it won't be for another two years, so this is replaced by uh, the round Sykes microphone that quality came into it. But that didn't matter because all the people in the front rooms wanted to hear was Peter Eckersley, their best friend, telling them stories and jokes, humour, skits, being rude about people, um, telling them that it was all right and that as they came out of the Spanish flu pandemic that there was a bright future because we're now going into the roaring 20s, the golden age, and all of this is part of the riddle explosion in new technology communication, new ideas, thoughts, entertainment. It cannot be more sufficiently emphasised that that pioneer adventure was born in laughter, was nurtured in laughter, and died in laughter. In America, it's become very commercial. If you want to sell tyres or bread, or in some cases, some quite unsavoury ideas, quite extreme political resonance, you just build a radio station, increase the power, and get your message across Europe. In this country, the Postmaster General, who then controlled all communications, telephone, telegraphs, said that's not gonna happen here. And really what they basically come up with is the big six companies, including Marconi who held all the master patents, decide that, this is driven by Godfrey Isaacs, who is the managing director of the Marconi company based here in New Street, they decide that they need a single company to control all broadcasting in Britain. And with a great amount of wit and wisdom, they call it the British Broadcasting Company. Not a corporation yet, it's a company. They're going to appoint John Reith, who has no idea what radio is. He's a financier, tall, six foot five, gaunt Scotsman with a huge scar from World War I's cheek. He just thinks it's interesting, a business. And what does he need? He needs someone who understands radio. January 1923 picks up the phone, Peter Eckersley in this room, still transmitting to MT Riddle, still incredibly popular, still building airborne radios and wirelesses. He basically goes to meet Reith and decides in the spur of the moment that he's going to leave his beloved Marconi. He didn't even tell his wife that he's going to join this new BBC. He arrives in February 1923. His office is covered under the stairs. He knows he's the chief engineer, because guess what? He's the only engineer. When he leaves seven years later, he has a team of over 700 men. There are main radio broadcast stations in every city, relay stations around it, and 95% of the British population can hear radio 
on two or more channels. He's also in started shortwave broadcasting across Europe. He's also developed a regional scheme where suddenly the north and the south of England have very different programs. And of course then the Irish stations come in as well. So Eckersley, not only at Rittle will define the humour, the wit and the rules, then as an engineer and a superb engineer, he will define the technology behind it. And don't forget, alongside all this, there is the birth of mass manufacture. Because people, not everybody can be a radio amateur and build their own crystal sets of art. They want to buy a set, switch it on and listen, because it's opera, comedy, humour, from all over the world, boxing matches, live sporting events, you know, f even football and rugby is starting to be transmit. The Carpenter-Lewis fight was one of the first boxing matches to go out. Really, it's perhaps a shame that the BBC, or under Reith, um, took upon them two of the three mantlers. It would educate, it would inform. Did it entertain? Well, that's I'll leave up to your listeners to decide. I've often thought of those early days, and of course one gets captured by nostalgia. But at the same time, I do think that before administration and organisation overtook the BBC, there was a certain naturalness that although it was perhaps not so beautifully regulated, not so suave, so polished, so dressed in spats as it may be today. This hut has had quite a history. So this was, I say, part of the Royal Flying Corps, taken by Marconi's, and they used it until 1963 as a development hut. In this hut, they also built the 1155 receiver that flew in every bomber command and coastal command aircraft during World War II. By 1963, it was a little tired. They donated it to the King's Road Junior School in Chelmsford, where it served as their sports hall for another 20 years. Um, its only claim to fame then was that a certain player called uh, Jeff Hurst used to change in there. And once upon a time, is it all over? They think it is now. He scored a couple of goals at one of the World Cup. So the hut has a, a footballing pedigree as well. When the, the, the school decided it no longer served their purpose, it was too small, it was dismantled and bought here to Sanford Mill by volunteers and put into store. 2000, 2002, it was decided to recreate it, to rebuild it as a testimony and a, as a memorial to what happened here. The birth of mass manufacture, led by a company called Marconi Phone, is going to lead directly to everything we now know. Mass manufacture of iPhones, and of course, when we go to war again in 1939, Mass manufacture is going to be the secret to victory because we have to build radio sets and electronics and radar equipment in huge quantities. It has to be reliable and robust. All that comes out of the birth of British radio broadcasting 100 years ago in this very room. And don't forget, there are other things. Christopher Cockrell worked in this end room for nearly nine years. While he was in that room, he had his first ideas about a boat that could float on air. You'd now call it the hovercraft. He was actually a brilliant receiver engineer, Chris Cockrell. So the, the hut also did a huge amount of work on radar during World War II and on airborne wireless and communications during World War II. So really this hut for the last hundred years has been intertwined and has looped through all of the communications and the history of broadcasting and radio as we know it. And so, well, our concert ended and as usual CQ, yes, yes, the usual song, I know, Dear S, the concert ended, sad wells the heterodyne. You must soon switch off your valves, I must soon switch off mine. Write back and say you heard me, your distance and where and how. Hark for the engines failing. Wow, 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 wow. And, 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 and like that. Well, well, good night, CQ. God bless you and keep you. I can't. God bless you. Goodbye. Good night.